The story of Screen Junkies and Collider is a story about a group of people who lost touch, who forgot what made them famous, people blinded by a chance at relevance to such an extent that they turned away their oldest fans, betrayed a friend without evidence, and sold long-time credibility for short-term success. This is a video about the fall of Screen Junkies and Collider, and the cancellation of Andy Signor. Andy Signor is a content creator who had joined Break Media in 2011 and made videos for their website, which targeted a young male demographic. At this time, Signor's role was lead of creative and digital content. He would later become vice president of content at Defy Media and then senior vice president of content. Signor also co-created some of the earliest videos for Break's channel, Screen Junkies, including supercuts and humorous celebrity interviews. Together with his colleague, Brett Weiner, he co-created the Screen Junkies show and Honest Trailers. Also for Screen Junkies, Signor would go on to create the pop culture debating show, Movie Fights. In the early days of YouTube, Honest Trailers, which was a parody of a real trailer, accompanied with slick editing and a professional narrator, would become a smash hit on YouTube. This series would cause Screen Junkies to blow up, and each trailer would regularly accumulate over 1 million views. Signor, although not the most engaging personality on Screen Junkies, was undoubtedly a decent ideas man and a savvy businessman within the industry. Although Defy Media and Andy's friends at Screen Junkies would later downplay his role, Signor was absolutely the most integral part of the growth of Screen Junkies. This was still very much in the early days of YouTube, where people made videos for fun, and the growing of Screen Junkies, a channel which would later have a full professional studio and large crew, was an innovation at the time, and wouldn't have been possible without Andy Signor. As Screen Junkies was carve out a niche for itself in YouTube, covering pop culture and movie news, it was accompanied by other such channels, all of which would have a boom period in the years 2012, until in around 2018. The early 2010s were a sort of boom period for YouTube. Past the days of weird viral memes and funny cat videos, people realised you can make a real living on YouTube. This is where we started to see creators rise up such as PewDiePie, Shane Dawson and Smosh. Screen Junkies was one of these, and this was a time where movie and pop culture related content was in high demand. Other channels would grow in the space at this time such as Red Letter Media, Jeremy Johns, Chris Stuckman, as well as AMC Movie Talk, which was led by John Campia and John Schnepp, which would later turn into Collider. Looking back, this seemed like a more innocent time in the world, before everything became overly politicised. People had different values, but it wasn't a determining factor on whether you were a good or bad person. Nowadays, it's commonplace for a content creator's audience to share values such as them, whether they're left, right, politically correct or anti-politically correct. Back then, this didn't seem to be the case unless you're making political content. People really didn't care what values a movie reviewer had, as long as they made entertaining content, and most of all, gave impartial and decent reviews. Another reason the early 2010s were an interesting time is that there's a lot of good faith for companies. People back then thought Disney buying Star Wars was great. The Marvel Cinematic Universe and the DC Cinematic Universe were incredibly hyped as well. The old caricature of people being afraid to state that they were nerds or into more pop culture and nerdy topics was gone. There was a space on YouTube where people could share those passions and channels that catered to such content. Various aforementioned channels rode this wave, gaining in subs, Notably, these channels had likeable personalities, made simple content, and had audience trust. Some of these channels expanded greatly back then during the peak years of 2011 to 2018, mainly Collider and Screen Junkies, while the likes of Red Letter Media, Jeremy Johns and Chris Stuckman largely remained independent. Screen Junkies and Collider would establish large professional looking studios and expand their cast. Screen Junkies were built off the back of Andy Signor, Dan Merrill, Hal Rudnick and Spencer Gilbert. While at the centre of Collider's success was John Campia, John Schnepp, and later on the Schmoes, Christian Harloff and Mark Ellis. This was a great time if you ran a successful pop culture channel. There was a perfect combination of high view slash interest, audience trust, and the ability to orbit around the mainstream. Seemingly everyday people ran these channels, but they would still eventually get invites to the likes of premieres and meet celebrities. These connections to Hollywood did not seem too egregious at the time, as Disney Star Wars and the DCEU was still largely a hype train at the time, and Marvel was also doing extremely well. Importantly, the political lines in the sand that would be drawn over the next few years were still yet to come to fruition. At these times, the audience were still a mixture of liberal and conservative people, but mostly people who didn't care about politics and just enjoyed following these personalities covering movie news. Collider and Screen Junkies began to create new series, most notably The Schmodown, a movie trivia quiz show on Collider, and Movie Fights, a movie debate show on Screen Junkies. Looking back on the demise of these shows, it seems like a massive missed opportunity given the viral success of shows like Hot Ones. I'll go over the reasons why both of these failed later on in the video. 
Collider's content would mostly consist of Collider Movie Talk, Jedi Council, a Star Wars show, and Collider Heroes, a show covering comic book movies. Each show would bring in hundreds of thousands of views every day. Screen Junkies was undoubtedly the most successful channel in this area, hitting in around 6 million subs and grabbing 6 million views every week. The coverage that Collider and Screen Junkies would provide for movies would result in them receiving invites to movie premieres or they'd meet celebrities who starred in the films. As I said, there was a more innocent outlook on things at the time, with not many fans seeing this as an egregious shattering of impartiality, the most important quality of a movie reviewer. This was mainly due to the fact that Marvel, DC and Star Wars were still largely viewed as brands in good standing, so attendance of premieres coupled with good reviews of these films didn't really ring alarm bells. I even remember as a fan at the time, when Christian Harloff, John Campia and Mark Ellis got to attend the premiere for Star Wars The Force Awakens, I was pleased seeing it as a worthy reward for all the coverage they've done for the movie over the past few years. As I said, a more innocent time. 2017 is arguably the year that marked the beginning of the end for these two channels, mainly down to the politicisation that would seep into all corners of entertainment, the release of Star Wars The Last Jedi, the failure of the DC Cinematic Universe, and the cancellation of Andy Signor. One reason for the massive growth of these channels was the huge interest audience had in the various properties. However, after the failure of the DC Cinematic Universe with Justice League and Batman vs Superman, audience interest in people covering those movies began to dip slightly, albeit there still was Star Wars and the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It seems after the election of Donald Trump and Brexit, politics was no longer a signifier of what value someone might have had, but whether you're a good or bad person. There was anti-social justice warrior content versus pro-social justice warrior channels. The intellectual dark web rose to prominence. It also seemed in certain places you really couldn't be open about your politics for risk of losing your job or be placed in lower standing. Many of the ones thought to be wholesome figures who ran these channels became more vocal about their political opinions. And I think a lot of us who were, you know, this is, this is before our time a little bit, forget that these issues, like today it's, it's the cool thing that whenever any, ever anybody brings up, hey, like, let's look at some gender equality and let's look at some fairness, whatever. Uh, there are the brain-dead morons of the world who go, social justice warrior! Uh, so, oh, like, like, just go back and keep humping your sister. Um, so I also want to state that having politics is not a problem in and of itself. This is the sort of politics that if you disagree with me, you're a bad person. For example, Andy Signor himself came after PewDiePie during his attempted cancellation attempt saying PewDiePie was condoning hateful attitudes. Spencer Gilbert would call the NRA a terrorist organization, and Nick Mundy would regularly spar with fans on Twitter regarding politics. All of a sudden, original subs from these channels from the beginning weren't going to hang around to support people who seemingly had contempt for them. However, it was the cancellation of Andy Signor that would follow in 2017 that would leave a permanent black mark on screen junkies, as well as any personalities that orbited the channel, such as those on Collider who would make statements on the situation. The day after the sexual abuse allegations about Harvey Weinstein came to the fore, as well as the birth of the Me Too movement, a woman named Emma Bowers would come forward on Twitter. She claimed to have once worked as an intern for Signor, and he came across a series of nude pinup photos she made. Bowers claimed that Signor messaged her saying that he pleasured himself to these photos, and that he insisted that he could come over to her place to do it in person. Bowers would play up the angle that Signor was her boss, and that she was a woman working under him, and there was a blatant abuse of power in this situation. Bowers would also claim that this experience soured her desire to get into the industry, and that she was sickened that someone like Andy Signor could make money in that same industry. The most serious allegation would come from a woman named April Dawn. April had appeared on Screen Junkies on numerous occasions, most notably on a Movie Fights episode, where she bombed pretty bad. She would also date Schmoes and Collider Orbiter JTE. April claimed that Andy tried to force himself on her, and while she went to the HR of Defy Media, they continued to protect Andy Signor, ignoring her allegations. She also claimed the HR department did not take her seriously and only had Andy's interests in mind. She went on to further state that Andy Signor would threaten JTE's job if she would come forward. Some of April's allegations were that Andy took out sex toys and tried to force them in her, took pictures of her without her permission, and promised her a position at Screen Junkies in exchange for sexual favours. These two main allegations of sexual assault and abuse of power resulted in many other women coming forward, all sharing DMs of experiences with Andy. Notably, none of these DMs showed any hint of sexual assault or harassment, merely Andy trying to flirt with fans and leaving when he was rejected. Although at the time, in the heat of the Me Too movement, these DMs acted as corroborative evidence to Emma and April's claims. Screen Junkies crew, and apparently Andy's friends, would waste no time in coming forward to voice their opinions. Hal Rudnick stated, Shocked, saddened, and disgusted by the news today, I believe and support the women who come forward. 
Screen Junkies producer and another supposed friend of Signor stated, I'm numb, I don't know what to do, questioning everything I thought I knew. To those that come forward, I hear you and I believe you. While Spencer Gilberts tweeted, Sick and saddened and frankly in shock right now, not going into work, that's for sure. In the wake of these allegations, Defy Media would terminate Andy's contract with immediate effect. Signor was no longer a part of Screen Junkies, and a once untainted brand now had a forever lasting black eye. This was a massive event at the time. Andy's face featured alongside Harvey Weinstein on the main article that broke the news about the Me Too movement and Harvey Weinstein's sexual assault and rape allegations. Andy's career was done, his marriage was done, and he'd later state that if not for his son, he likely would have hung himself during this time. Following on from Signor's cancellation, another major event occurred that would change pop culture and these channels forever. If you weren't following Star Wars or these movie review channels at this time, it's hard to state how big of a rift this movie caused between critics and fans. Many fans would state that this movie disrespected the legacy of Star Wars. Many people would also hate The Last Jedi for the politics that were injected into the movie. Notably, an anti-capitalist message by Disney of all corporations, an overt feminist message with Rey being better than Luke Skywalker at every turn. Luke Skywalker was famously a character who'd never give up on what he believed was right. He was willing to die because he saw a shred of good in his father. Now in this new movie, he was willing to kill his own nephew who had not done anything wrong yet, merely on a hunch. Rey, this new protagonist, was shown to be more moral than Luke Skywalker, being able to best him in a fight despite growing up in the desert, while Luke was a Jedi master. Now for anyone that has ever set foot in a martial arts gym, boxing, BJJ, anything, it's pretty ridiculous the concept of a beginner beating a black belt. The movie would also feature a number of plot holes, and anticlimactic payoffs to setups in the previous movie, all because Ryan Johnson is a director who prides himself on subverting expectations. To speak for myself, for example, I remember seeing Collider's review of the movie, thinking, oh, brilliant, this is going to be great, and then leaving the theatre thinking, what the hell did they watch? This ushered in a time when directors and movie personnel, upon being confronted and criticised by people on Twitter, would result that you didn't like the movie because you're a racist, sexist, basement-dwelling person. It was a major rift between Hollywood and fans. The once good faith people had in these companies began to shred and die away. Battle lines were drawn between the media class, the Hollywood class, and regular people. The question was which side would the likes of Collider and Screen Junkies take? While well, in this time, Collider above all acted as a sort of propaganda wing for these companies, putting up videos such as, did bots destroy The Last Jedi's Rotten Tomatoes rating? Is this the most bold Star Wars movie ever created? The overwhelming support for such a flawed and hated movie, coupled with the crew's attendance at the premieres for these movies, now began to set off major alarm bells for audiences. Poster, what a brilliant, brilliant poster this is. This is the best poster that they have released so far. Love this poster. Might be my favorite movie poster I've seen this year so far. Be my God, Star Wars, Star Wars, Star Wars. Star Wars, Star Wars, Star Wars, Star Wars, Star Wars, Star Wars. Lightsabers, trailers, posters, red, Star Wars, everything Star Wars. And if you hate it, the tra I'm taking a bat to your house. I don't appreciate the haters coming right out and telling me this trailer sucked. It's so I, I mean, easy for them to hate. I, I, like, don't, I don't get it. Go ahead and hate. Nobody's listening to you idiots, okay? Yeah. Just go ahead and hate. The trailer sucked. The trailer sucked. What do you want? People who care that it sucks, it sucks. We like it. We're always going to like it. It's effing Star Wars. You don't come to me and say it sucks. I love Star Wars. I'm wearing a goddamn Star Wars shirt for... St don't just say it sucks. You suck. Granted, I just became obsessed with Star Wars, what, like a year ago, thanks to all of these nerdos. <laughs> but welcome. I'm so freaking obsessed. Just on a scale of 1 to 10, how surprised or shocked were you by this news? Sc surprised? 10. Worried? 2. There's been reported problems on all of them or reported concerns. But guess what? That's filmmaking. But I'm not worried because I take it as a good thing. I'd, I'd rather have them correct it like they maybe it did with Rogue One. We're like, hey, there's some things we need fixing. Let's bring in Gilroy. Let's reshoot some of these things and get it right in our eyes. What you read in the Variety Report is they go as, as far as to say like, Kathleen Kennedy didn't like the way they folded their socks. That's an actual quote from the, so then just like safe, which is what probably Kasdan and Kathleen Kennedy and Disney wants to do. And there's nothing wrong with that. They're doing the Rogue One kicked ass, Force Awakens kicked ass. They've got the formula that works. So Ron Howard or not, I'm okay with this kind of safe pick. This is not the first time it happened. Hopefully this is the shining example of how you can have a replacement come in, knock it out of the park, and we can all live to see another day at another Star Wars standalone movie.
This wasn't a once-off either. There was many allegations of the Collider and Screen Junkies crew, along with other channels in that same sort of genre, shilling for movies. The shilling would become so obvious and go to such a comical degree as Collider Jedi Council doing a partnership with Denny's who were promoting the Han Solo movie, or Christian Harloff and Mark Ellis would sit in Denny's, eat Denny's food and review Star Wars toys, stating how much they were looking forward to the movie. A far cry from two guys who used to sit on the bed and review movies. Is it good? What do we got? Cuisine is always here, Christian. So much great food, trading cards, collector cups to get into. But first, it's basically like you're at a Denny's in a galaxy far, far away, which is kind of how I feel right now. We're debuting some of the new menu items they have at uh, Denny's you guys can check out. So we have the light speed slam, which is the healthy fit option for somebody like me who currently employs a personal trainer. Two moon skillet, diced ham, fresh spinach, sauteed mushrooms, and hash browns topped with gouda cheese sauce, cheddar cheese, and two eggs the Star Wars experience here at Denny's because we also have these collector cups that I'm very excited about. With some of your favorite characters, you get the cool Falcon design on there. The more packs you get, the better chance you have of getting one of the special foil cards. They made these special foil cards. There's one in every hundred packs and they're already going for like a couple hundred dollars on eBay right now, which Something that's really cool that you can check out right now at Denny's.com is the Smuggler's Dice Sweepstakes, which is basically giving you the fans the opportunity to roll the dice. You're rolling Han Solo's dice. You see the dice hanging? He hangs them onto the, I think it's the little... Especially uh, have so much to do in this movie. Right? I mean, especially after everything with Last Jedi, it's all... like. This, and when you go back and watch that scene, there's going to be so much yeah. more... It was in this time as well that Red Letter Media would bring out their Nerd Crew series parroting the likes of Screen Junkies and Collider. To many people who haven't heard of Screen Junkies and Collider, this sort of exposed the shilling corporate atmosphere of these companies. Mike, Jay and Rich would create hilarious videos where they'd stack the table in front of them full of merchandise, wear over-the-top branded clothing, and pick apart these channels. This isn't a video about Solo, a Star Wars story. It's just a video about how we saw Solo, a Star Wars story. And shill a bunch of products. Hint, the movie... It was... What the f***? What are you eating? Denny's. What? Denny's! Where you always get fantastic cuisine. Let me tell you guys, I have a lot to say about this trailer. So many Easter eggs, so many little details. I've gone through the trailer and I've analyzed almost every second. Christian Harloff and the Schmoes would initially roll with the blow, albeit with some level of passive aggressiveness, before Christian would later call Red Letter Media bullies for doing so. The point is that every single person in this room, behind that camera, leave each other the fuck alone when yeah, they want to have opportunities and opinions on what they want to think. You, you can think whatever the fuck you want to think. Fuck leave yeah. people alone. And it is, it is not, it is not fucking wrong to be passionate about Star Wars. It's not fucking wrong to be passionate about any movie that you like. Going to Comic-Cons, going to Celebration. And you think it is, and you think, oh, well, well you're too old to be doing it. Fuck you. <laughs> fuck you in the face. Because you should be able to do whatever the fuck you want and be passionate about it. Fuck you for making fun of people for being passionate about their shit. Go suck in a fucking toad fart. <laughs> people who used to be excited and enjoy watching shows like Jedi Council now began to see the over-the-top shilling as a parody of itself. Another blow to the credibility of these channels was the infamous Christian Harloff meltdown. Disney would bring out Galaxy's Edge, a Star Wars-themed addition to Disneyland. Certain members of Collider were invited to attend the opening of the park albeit the more journalistic side of Collider. Christian Harloff and other members of the Jedi Council crew were not invited. Christian would lose it on air, stating he was refusing to cover Collider's coverage of the park, to which a producer stepped in and said, you will cover it, it is ours. This is where Christian lost it and began arguing live on air with the producer. Despite the fact Christian Harloff had previously called Red Letter Media bullies for their Nerd Crew series, this was the confirmation of everything Red Letter Media were parodying in the first place. It was so comical that Red Letter Media actually toned down doing Nerd Crew afterwards. There was really nothing left to make fun of. They see Collider, yes, and they go, "Oh, it's everything." Correct. So everything that you know, that, they already that, invited Collider. Well, they think every, yeah. right. They think everything that Christina and, and Haley will will see is yes. that they will that they will now go on Jedi Council and do right. it, and that's not how it works. Part of doing your job and is talk about it. About yeah, but it, I, yeah. I, and I'm going to be stubborn and say I don't want to. Okay, <laughs> um, I, and I You're don't. You're going to though. What's that? You're going to. I don't want to. Uh, no, because it's our coverage. Uh, Haley's got a lot of really good interviews with Imagineers, 
uh, that she's going to be posting. So first on. of all, first of all, I don't want you to do that on the air. You can call me in afterwards. No, no, so no, no, you know no. what? So then someone else hosts the show today. Someone else hosts the show today. You you don't have. It's the second time you're, you've done this. The first time you've done this, you burst in the door. You burst in the door and screamed at us because we played the YouTube video no, and we no, didn't no, no, know no. it. I, I, that was I, the first time. I went in. I went in to let you know that you have been taken off the air already. I know, but you screamed at us. For I didn't it. scream. I you, just you I didn't. Roxy did he yell at us. I said, "Hey, you've been, you were off the air." Roxy, did he yell at us? Uh, There's a clip. I, it's it's you, pretty. You, it's yeah, sad. yeah. The, an, the answer is yes. You yes, yelled yes. at us, and you embarrassed us in front of Kate Mulligan, who was sitting here too. If you want to do this on the air, I'll do it on the air. I would much no, no, rather no, you, you did. You 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 started this on the air. You brought. You 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 started the show by saying you're not going to talk about it on Jedi Council, which and I, is your show. Okay, but you're not the producer of it, and I am actually. I am actually. You're actually I, I, not. I, yes, I am. I'm actually. That was the deal I made with Fernandez. No, I'm also actually, exa- uh, no, just the same, way you, the same way you didn't know. The same way you did. The same way you didn't know that I was the fucking head of development at one point, a head of content. Where you're like, oh, I think you're just head of development. I walk into to Fernandez. I go, can you clear it up? Content and development, to which now is not the case. You are, and I get it. But I, first of all, if you want to do this on the air, we do it on the air. But I am not, but I am absolutely not talking about it today. You can have Roka host it. How about that? I mean, if you don't want to host the show, because I don't want to. Oh, I'm so sorry you didn't get to go last night. You're welcome. See, you can if you want to do this again. We can do it all the only because you you have the same thing. And what people also don't realize no, with you, you're you act you act hot headed. You act you, hot headed all the time. You don't. You scream and yell at people, content. but you want to do it now. We can do it now. You don't want to cover Collider's content, is what you're just saying on on Collider Live. The expansion of the casts of both Collider and Screen Junkies was also a mistake that both channels made. Collider came up on a crew of likeable people. There was John Campia, a seemingly harsh Simon Cowell businessman figure, the Schmoes, who were seen as everyday sort of people just giving their opinions on movies, and John Schnepp. Now John Schnepp is one of the few people that I genuinely don't have anything bad to say about in this video. He gave a very important credibility to Collider when covering certain pop culture and nerd topics. He's one of the few genuine people who actually grew up reading comic books. He wasn't someone that just put on a Captain America t-shirt and claimed he was into these sort of things. Now, it's hard to understate how much of a blow for Collider the passing of John Schnepp was, but the air of authenticity and credibility he brought to Collider would pass with him. In these years, Christian would stack the Collider cast with members of his friends from Schmoes No, such as John Roca, Josh McCuga, Ken Knapsack, and Roxy Stryer. These were a collection of people who could best be described as jocks, wannabe actresses or actresses, wannabe producers, TV presenters, people who was kind of obvious that they didn't really have any interest in pop culture or nerdy topics. They were just there for a paycheck and for the exposure. Roxy Stryer would also randomly come out in a podcast with Christian Harloff that Andy Signor was incredibly inappropriate to her, a claim that she was never able to elaborate on what it was or produce evidence for when she was called upon to do so. For somebody from Defy to reach out to me before I gave my statement on Twitter, I was waiting for somebody to reach out to me. Here's what you should say publicly. That no, kind of thing. Oh. no. Are you okay? Oh. What happened to you? Because oh. I'm one of Look two women, women that worked for him as a host. Oh, right. Just to see if anything happened also inside of it. Did anything? Look at that. Look, Christian, who knows me. Christian, who knows Roxy, is like, oh, you mean in case you knew of anything else that happened? Because they would talk, guys. Never, never happened? I, I de- definitely didn't not happen. Oh, wow. Um, I didn't and know that. so I was waiting. Okay. And it never came. Oh, wow. And I didn't want to tweet something before I talked to them. And I- Collider was also taken over by businessman Mark Fernandez, who poorly managed the company, taking away some famous shows such as Collider Movie Talk, reducing the structured approach of Collider, sort of taking a throwing anything at the wall, seeing what works sort of approach, making deep fake series, Collider Podcasts. Collider Extras. One of Collider's most noteworthy shows was The Schmodown, a trivia quiz show. This was an easily digestible show which many fans enjoyed, even many passive fans enjoyed. They even managed to have some celebrities on The Schmodown from time to time. Whether it be Christian Harloff's ego or lack of intelligence, he would eventually ruin The Schmodown. Collider returned The Schmodown from a simple quiz trivia show into a sort of pro wrestling trivia show whereby the contestants would do a cut of pro wrestling promo at the start of the video and trash talk each other. There are certain levels where trash talking works. If you watch boxing or the UFC, it's pretty gripping when someone like Conor McGregor goes to war with someone like Khabib in the press conference. But the thing is, they're actually fighting. You get to see the results of that. Then there was pro wrestling, who built its fan base for years before coming out as fake. Even a number of pro wrestlers are actually fighters, such as Ronda Rousey, Cain Velasquez. They'll take Gable Stevenson right at the Olympics and give him a contract. The Schmodown would now be a bunch of sort of bland people cutting promos on each other for 30 minutes at the start of the video. It was sort of cringy and reduced the Schmodown from a show that could have gone viral in a few ways to one with just a small, dedicated fan base. In around this time, other movie review channels began to spring up. 
channels such as Geeks and Gamers, Mahler and Critical Drinker. In Mahler and Critical Drinker's case, these were independent personalities who were deeply critical on movies and offered a different perspective. Breath of fresh air considering all the shilling Collider was doing. Then there was Geeks and Gamers, a more right-leaning alternative to the likes of Collider and Screen Junkies, albeit one where its staff doesn't get invited to premieres, adding a layer of authenticity to its reviews. All these channels would be highly critical of the likes of Disney, and take a more consumer-friendly approach backing the side of fans, as opposed to the likes of Collider. It's also important to state yet again that this is not just about politics. Various comments, whether it be in videos or on Twitter by the likes of Jeremy Johns, Chris Stuckman, and Red Letter Media's Mike and Jay would suggest that they are more on the left-leaning side of politics. However, these channels flourished still to this day and during these times. These are independent channels who very much did their own thing. They never injected politics into their review, and you never got the sense that they viewed any of their conservative or right-leaning viewers as bad people. Mike and Jay would go after everybody. They'd make fun of crazy right-wingers in one video, and then make fun of crazy social justice warriors in another. Jeremy Johns and Chris Stuckman would also just stay in their craft, and not really comment on world events or politics. Red Letter Media would display their credibility by interviewing Max Landis one week and absolutely trashing his movie the next. We're very likable characters, but before we get into that, before we get into the movie, I mean, should we remind people of our, our association with our friend Max Landis? <laughs> Uh, we like Max. He's he's maybe former friend after this. I no, 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 no. Um, Max, Max. Uh, we we poorly reviewed his film uh, American Justice or uh, Wet Hot American. Problems were also brewing for Screen Junkies after throwing Andy Signor under the bus. This would sour some people to the channel as there's an obvious camaraderie there. Although now it appeared that the Screen Junkies crew were actually just people maintaining the illusion of friendship, but in reality were either people who covered for an abuser, or threw a friend under the bus with no evidence. With evidence coming out in later years, which I'll go into, it proved to be the latter. In the wake of the cancellation of Andy Signor, Screen Junkies would release a video called What Happened, where the remaining crew members would apologise to fans for what happened, and state that there's going to be a culture change of Screen Junkies to make sure that such things never happen again. Notably, Dan Merle would say in this video, that Screen Junkies were going to change their image and reduce divisiveness. He would state that this is not a place for disagreement. There were some, some things we did that invited divisiveness and that invited, you know, argument. And that's not what we want. Um, so we're even looking at ourselves and saying, like, what can we do better to, to make this not a place for, um, you know, disagreement, but a place for sincere discussion and conversation? Um, and, and I think that's really, that's certainly what brought me back, was the chance to take this and really do it learn right. from it. And, and, and we have a chance to rebuild this community. This culture shift would bring about the end of Movie Fights, a show where the contestants would get into heated arguments with each other, and the fans would do likewise in the comment sections. However, such a show no longer had a place in a now sanitized corporate environment like Screen Junkies, a place where, as Dan said, disagreements were not welcome. As I stated before, it's hard not to look back on Movie Fights as a massive missed opportunity, especially with the celebrity contacts that Screen Junkies had. Shows like Hot Ones where people sit down and eat chicken wings have gone hugely viral and attract massive brands. It's likely that with the right management, movie fights could have done the same. But the show would undergo various format changes as interest would wane and the show was eventually cancelled. Loss of credibility, a decrease in interest in pop culture topics, as well as competition from the likes of Mahler, Critical Drinker, Geeks and Gamers and Red Letter Media among others, would spell a huge drop in views for channels like Collider and Screen Junkies. Screen Junkies would eventually announce the cancelling of Screen Junkies Plus, as well as a number of staff would leave, such as Dan Merle. The same would happen with Collider, as John Campion and Christian Harloff would also leave the channel. The plug on every Collider show would be pulled pretty abruptly in January 2020, with Mark Fernandez announcing the cancellation of all these shows, and the letting go of all the Collider staff. Screen Junkies would also hugely downsize as well, getting rid of every single show apart from Honest Trailers with seemingly the only cast member remaining as Spencer Gilbert. News of the once disgraced Andy Signor would come to the fore again, with Variety publishing an article stating that Andy Signor had actually achieved a settlement with Defy Media for wrongful termination. Andy states in the article that while I will not discuss anything related to my former employee, I am relieved that this is finally behind me and looking forward to exposing the truth. Now that the case has been settled, I plan on releasing evidence and information that will absolutely refute the allegations of sexual assault, and retribution. I did not do these things, and in the coming days I'll provide materials to support this. I will speak up more honestly when I'm legally able to do so, but my settlement with Defy is important because I need to provide support for my family. 
Defy Media would sell Screen Junkies to fandom in 2018, and Defy's creditors froze its assets in November 2018, causing the company to lay off nearly all its remaining employees and cease operations. Andy would make his return making movie-related content on his channel Popcorn Planet, which would mostly underperform and be dislike-bombed, with many people thinking he's still a sexual abuser. A major bomb would be dropped when Andy would release a video called Hashtag Me Too Misfire, an honest defense of Andy Signor. Andy, while acknowledging his infidelity and flirtation with fans, completely disproved the allegations of Bowers and April Dawn, showing the boat encounters were flirtatious on both sides, providing messages to back up his claims. Andy would provide evidence that Bowers would in fact actually send him a link to her pinup photos. Emma Bowers went on Twitter and falsely inflated a decade-old mutually awkward exchange we had by painting me as a sex-crazed boss demanding action from an intern. Emma was not an intern, nor did she work with me at Screen Junkies, something I feel she irresponsibly allowed many news outlets to incorrectly run with. I worked with Emma years before Screen Junkies and was immensely impressed with her work ethic. And our many emails prove that Emma was the costume designer. She became a friend and was a creative partner on a small project we made together with a few other friends. A zero-budget internet series made a decade ago, not an actual production company per se, long before my time at Screen Junkies. Because the show was my concept, I did stand above her on the creative chain of command. But she had a more senior role than she implied. I was both surprised and flattered one evening when she opted to share with me a link to her own nude pinup photos. I don't recall saying exactly what she accused me of, but I am confident that I responded with compliments. I was married, so we both regretted the shift in tone, and we mutually apologized. We continued to work together for months without any problems or incidents until she bailed the night before on an important shoot. I remain perplexed that Emma would inflate our incident, comparing me to the criminal and abusive acts of Harvey Weinstein. Her specific charge forever plastered my name next to Weinstein's and opened the door for April's more aggressive allegations. Emma even admitted to waiting for April to come forward first, just a week before she spoke out about me. And that April Dawn was actually incredibly enthusiastic about their affair, even providing evidence that she in fact sent a nude photo to him and told him what room number she was staying at, despite the fact she had previously claimed that he show, showed up to her room uninvited. On October 6th, 2017, April O'Donnell tweeted the following, which should be noted, she also recently deleted, but it's been archived on many sites and news sources, and it originally stated this, Andy Signor tried to sexually assault me on multiple occasions. I trusted the company to do something considering two other women also came forward with me. They only had Andy's interests in mind. He threatened my boyfriend's job security, saying he would fire him if I told anyone. He took out sex toys and tried to force them in me, took pictures of me without my permission, and promised a position at Screen Junkies for sexual favors. I hope this encourages more women to come forward, because I believe you. April. Later that day, as many questioned her online, April posted a second, more detailed statement, which she has kept online. The first time, he used Chicago Comic Con by saying they were having a Screen Junkies party and I was invited. The party ended up being him, alone in his hotel room, trying to force himself on me. This is the first easy lie to prove. I did meet April in August 2015 at a convention in Chicago. She volunteered to participate in a live show we were shooting there, but ended up performing poorly due to her lack of knowledge about Martin Scorsese. I could tell it was just her nerves, but the audience was very disapproving. I felt bad for her, and I apologized to her after the show. We talked a lot, and I thought she was funny, and I didn't know anyone in Chicago. So we ended up exchanging numbers, which prompted some mutually flirtatious texts, including her offering to be a discreet, weird groupie for me. I invited her to my hotel room to watch a movie, which she was completely up for. There was no tricking her into a party. She knew we were discreetly chatting. I flat out asked her, want to just hang out in my room and watch a movie or something? She agreed. Then later asked, am I just bringing my sparkling personality? I responded, whatever you want. I'm not sure what we're going to do. Cute, nerdy girl coming up to my hotel room? I have never done that. Which was true. She showed up to my room, and we talked and played a movie card game. And while she was sitting on the bed, she batted her eyes at me several times. But I was too nervous to make a move. Our texts from the next morning show no hint of attempted assault. Instead, they show the opposite. First, she admits to having a lot of fun. And later, I admit my regret for not making a move. This was a sentiment that we both shared again later that day as we continued to text flirtatiously. Later that evening, she attempted to meet up with me again, but our schedules wouldn't allow it. We texted our goodbyes and agreed to hopefully see each other again. We ended up doing that rather quickly. 
After Chicago, I flew back home to Los Angeles. And about a week later, I texted her again. And I asked her if she had any regrets not making a move. As you can see from our text, she did. This is when our mutually flirtatious exchange became much more sexual in nature. April says I took photos of her without her permission. This is false. In fact, our emails clearly show that April was the one who sent various nude photos to me. This is also confirmed over texts. These photos are real, and they provide graphic evidence that April has not been telling the truth. As we continued to chat, the show she taped in Chicago aired on YouTube. But the comments upset her. I felt bad again, so I offered her a seat on our fan cam if she was ever in Los Angeles, which was a free opportunity that we offered all of our fans. April wanted to see me, and she was very much into the idea of being on the show again. We were communicating daily and talked about her visiting me again in Los Angeles. She then told me that her boss was a big fan and he would be more lenient about time off from work and going to California if she had the opportunity to be on the show. I told her no problem, so we figured out a date and she quickly booked her own ticket. None of this was mentioned in any of April's statements. Instead, her lies and false allegations continued, saying that she was later invited by Screen Junkies to come out to LA to be on the fan cam. She says I stopped by her hotel uninvited and took a sex toy out of my bag and tried to use it on her. She then says I threatened to kick her out of the hotel if she told anyone, and that I later used her relationship with her boyfriend against her, saying if she told anyone, I would have him fired. Our texts clearly reveal we planned the visit. As a matter of fact, we had been constantly talking about hooking up while she visited, and she very clearly invited me to her hotel room. I did not show up to her hotel room uninvited. This video majorly changed things for Andy and brought him a lot of attention. This also gave him a sort of fresh start where he was able to move forward and steadily grow an audience. However, the majority of outlets and people who reported on Signal originally refused to update their story or even comment on it when he cleared his name, with the exception of Philip DeFranco and with mostly right-leaning outlets covering him, such as The Quartering and Geeks and Gamers. This became a huge elephant in the room for the remaining Screen Junkies members, such as Dan, Hal and Spencer, and most of all for Andy's accusers April and Emma. Basically, all parties would effectively ignore and refuse to comment on the new evidence. These are people who were complicit in destroying a man's life and career a few years ago, but now that he completely cleared his name, their response was effectively no comment. While it's obvious why the likes of April or Emma Bowers didn't comment on the situation, there is some room for explanation for the likes of Dan, Hal and Spencer, more than likely because they couldn't easily explain how easily they threw a friend under the bus and were willing to believe false accusations of people over a long-time friend and co-worker. Not one of the Screen Junkies crew, whether it be Hal, Spencer or Dan, would ever reach out to Andy. Andy would release a series of videos calling these people out, as well as going into detail about some of the failures of Screen Junkies. These expose-esque videos and the attention that came with them would help Andy navigate his way through these difficult years, while he rebuilt his life, finding a new family and home in Florida, and as well as a perspective on the world. Andy would also build a new crew around himself, such as Jody from Jody's Corner and Steph from Steph the Alternate, people who saw the wrongs done to Andy and supported him. While I'm not personally a fan of Andy, I do think it's commendable that he didn't go down the reformed left-winger route that we see so often with the likes of, say, Jack Murphy, Dave Rubin. Andy would constantly acknowledge in videos while he was now wary of the social justice warrior culture and the cancel culture that is prevalent on the left. He didn't want to go down the route of grifting anti-social justice warrior, you know, the reformed leftist who sees the error in their ways and now milks the right for money. People who aren't genuinely right-wingers or believe in any of those values but see a gap in the market for a reformed social justice warrior. Something we've seen all too often the last number of years. Andy would also go on to explain how him and Dan would briefly communicate and that Dan would still condemn Andy on the basis that he flirted and dated with some fans. Andy would later prove this to be highly hypocritical given Dan's current girl girlfriend met him under the auspices of being a Screen Junkies fan. Did Dan call you out so much? Why did Dan turn so quickly on you? What's going on? Why does Dan speak so crappily behind your back? It involves this. But Dan, I tried to speak to you. I tried to ration with you. This was not okay with me. It never was. Mm -hmm. And you made that video to every one of our fans condemning me as an abuser. When your girlfriend oh, started it, bro, he's your watching. girlfriend came at me. I'm looking at his face right now. Someone, his Your girlfriend came at me, Dan, and I'm, I'm oh. sickened by the fact that you think I'm the crazy he's one. Scared. Andy and Popcorn Planet would go on to find major success covering drama-related topics such as the Gabby Petito case, Britney Spears' conservatorship, and the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial. 
While some have criticised Andy for mining drama topics for content, I'm not sure I begrudge a man who went through one of the worst cancellings we've seen in modern years, being lumped in with Harvey Weinstein and being innocent all this time from finding a way to provide for his family. As I stated in the intro, the fall of Collider and Screen Junkies is a story about people who forgot what made them famous, who let their egos get in the way, who were happy to throw away their credibility for short-term success. Ironically, many of the Schmoes and Screen Junkies crew would try to go independent and make a name for themselves outside those companies, and the only member having any real success outside was Andy Signore. 